listeners, here we are again, and we're in the, almost in the middle of, of this little series with Matthew Vaughan, who, if anybody doesn't know what he does, he's the Director of Aviation Security and Cyber, and he's also got a sideline of emergency management that he looks after. And uh, we're now on episode three, which is from screen to secured, change or be changed, and security as a commercial asset. And just as a little side, which most people won't know what I'm talking about, we've got a safe word, which is called Spain. So if uh, if Matthew decides that my questions are too difficult or probing, he will say Spain. And we'll explain that at some point in the future. Right, Matthew, lovely to have you on. Episode three. Here we go. Yeah, thanks, Chris. So not, now, not any specific part of Spain, right? Just just Spain. Don't worry, mate. We'll keep that. <laughs> we'll keep that one under the hat until it needs to come out. So, listen, right from screened to secured. All right, you want to just take us through what you consider to be that particular process? Yeah, thanks. So, this is most certainly within the context of uh, the supply chain in terms of air cargo and logistics that are that are attached to that. So, we have learned a great deal in the last 20 years from from that that big big moment that we um referred to as as the 20th anniversary last september yeah and air cargo itself um you know, what's it been over, over 11 years since um the sort of yemen type type situation we have had a very successful counterterrorism related operations around the world that have uh, in, in coordination with, um, you know, growing standards and growing sense of security maturity across industry and governments, we're now at a point, or at least I'm personally advocating for this point, this this juncture in time where the the proverbial firewall, if you like, where we want to see, touch, screen, um, and clear everything that goes through the system. Uh, th- those those days are changing, and it's yeah. and it, and it's now about applying those those firewall measures that I that I just refer to in a in a colloquial sense, and it's applying that in an intelligent risk based way, based on data sets and data points that you've been able to achieve further up further up the supply chain, and uh, it it's. It's not only the facilitation piece, right? In in again, just facilitating security and and products through through the supply chain, but it it really is about intelligently applying security measures to where they're they're greatest needed. The the yeah. high risk, if you like, which which we do have a a universal term for what that means, but it's very seldom applied in a in a true risk based intelligent way. So. But why, 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 Matthew? Because uh, I mean, well, I say why, but if you look at if you look most of our industry, and especially now as a result of what's happened in COVID, most industries now are given a lot more attention and respect and credibility to risk assessments, risk mm-hmm. awareness, um, you know, artificial intelligence, and and identifying things ahead of time, mm-hmm. and then having a sustainability out- outlook for the business. But far too many companies don't do it until it's too late. Mm. It's it's trust, really. It's it's you know what are the what are the strategies, what are the mechanisms that enable you to have trust between between customers, governments, and you know stakeholders within that supply chain, and then within an international context, which you know is predominant for, for air cargo. How how do you get these jurisdictions to trust each other? That the controls or the secured controls that are applied at a at a point of uplift, um, when those commodities land in that jurisdiction, um, what else needs to actually take place from a from a security point of view? And how do you do that in a trust trustful, um, transparent way? Right. And we we kind of have some of that on the passenger side. There are improvements. Um, obviously, the health. Uh, the imposition of the health um, requirements over the last couple of years have kind of stalled that a little bit, but um, it's not going to take long before we can start to achieve better, better trust between between territories on on basic um, security controls. But in in the air cargo sense, 
we have those advantages in terms of transit and transfer screening already in place today, but we're still the, we're still putting um, commodities through X-rays and you know ETDs and um, explosive detection and search uh, search methodologies that that at least I don't think you need to apply all of it through those conventional screening measures. You have to be able to collect data points, and trust data to further upstream that allows you to have a, a greater level of assurance on, on what these commodities are and, and you know, the, the control that, is, that has taken place in terms of how they've been manufactured, how they've then been transported, how they arrive to an aviation facility. There, there has to be a better way to be able to intelligently apply, um, you know, screening measures to to and, and the old the old terminology is trusted and untrusted. Yeah. Well, is you know is that fit for purpose in in today's environment? There, there are parts of it where yes, if you can trust it, absolutely. But how do you how does that security status? actually transfer between all those stakeholders without being diminished or or turn turn into to a high risk right and 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 for us or at least for me personally and and of course the the organization that i work for that that is hidden within the digital digital properties digital elements um of how we put together uh, airway bills and and commodity information so so just just to just to make it I was going to say just to simplify it for everybody else, but but probably just to simplify it for myself. Um, what you're saying then is that the the current the traditional um, ways of of screening that would then be in the future if all things were equal that would then be a random and and uh, yep. and and a you know a, a, <clears throat> I'll just say random, but also a, a a prescribed random and a prescribed extra search so that it wouldn't be causing so much problems. With regards to the supply chain, but it would also allow certain companies, products, uh, routes, etc., to be of a lower risk, so that they would bypass that. Apart from a few random selections over the course of the normal, from validation to verification. But can I ask you something? So, so because like, and and yourself, you're a well-travelled man, apart from Spain. But um, for you. Um, I'm only joking there. You know what I mean. <laughs> but um, but what, what I'm saying is um, if you look at some of the places that you've been to mm. and you had a pipeline and, and it was and the pipeline was coming from point A to point B, you mm. would trust that pipeline from point A. But if it was going from point B to point A, would you trust it in the reverse? You know, there's there's certain there's certain pipelines I'd most definitely would want to cap. Because I wouldn't trust, I wouldn't trust the way the way it was being handled. To your point on unpredictability and that sort of, um, you know, unpredictability as a measure, you're absolutely right. I think that will always that will always be there and and needs to be part of um, any sort of security system, right? It, it, it not just specific to this, but to to some of these high export locations where they have very specific commodities that are being developed. Uh, and you then perceivably have either deterior- deteriorating, you know, geopolitical environment or a, or a national yeah. security environment. You, you're right that they are they are locations where different kinds of measures, you know, if you could almost say high risk measures are being applied. You then have, um, in in terms of air cargo, you then have obviously the difference between. Sort of passenger aircraft that carry belly, belly cargo and and all freighter, um, you know, um, operators. So uh, that changed with Annex Seventeen just recently. So the measures are they they don't differentiate between you know passenger aircraft and freighter aircraft. So that yeah. the the international obligations are, are in place, but there are still advantages. There are still security advantages to to be had in some of these locations. Um, Either based on commodity, but getting to that that point of that point of trust. I mean, you and I personally know of of a location not far from where we worked in the Middle East, and no matter how many foreign um, inspections and audits that took place, no matter how much you spent on trying to raise capability in in those parts of the world, it it just 
you know, was in 2022 was still in that same was still in that same condition. Uh, but export volumes are still moving the way that they need they need to move. And the conundrum so, is the conundrum is the value of the export markets. Yeah. And and yeah. so when when you know when it comes when you got the old um, you know the greenback against the yeah, yeah. Uh, you know the, the logic and the security there's a you know there's always this tug of war and it's uh, it's crazy. Let me ask you something. The, the other thing that I never understand right is um, we've got all these procedures in place and quite rightly so. And we look at it and, and what we said here from screen to secured. It's almost as if you 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 leave all the windows and the front door open, but the back door is where you focus everything, which is that last and final point of mm. the acceptance of cargo. Mm. Now, downstream, so looking at the upstream opportunities to make people more aware and to put certain prerequisites in place, Matthew. Mm. I mean, governments and 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 all regulated bodies, they've got to come together and start stipulating. If you want to do something, this is the way you shall do it, not the way yeah. you should do yeah. it. This is the way you shall do it. Yeah. And if we find that you don't do it that way, the penalties have got to be so punitive, mm. Matthew, that mm. it you know it, it it takes out ninety odd percent of the willingness to try it because the penalties aren't so severe. <laughs> You're right. the the uh, The method in which we're talking about from screen to secured is, of course, the the consignment security declaration, right? Which yeah. is which is IATA's version of capturing the security status. What which that that's the international obligation, the the security status, and the um the sort of industry resolution piece is is the the CSD. But to your point, there are as far as I'm aware, um, you know, economic sanctions could be about the only um, sort of, you know, disincentive, if you like, for um, various supply chains that are just simply not following basic international standards. But that's that's so, almost like saying that, you know, if you carry on the way you are, you're not, you're, your mother-in-law won't talk to you anymore. Correct. <laughs> That that that's right. So um, let me just get my train of thought on that one. But uh, so the the ICAO, the again the ICAO system is not there for enforcement. It it's it's a it's a diplomatic channel, right? It's and so enforcement has to occur at a bilateral at a bilateral level. Um, and of course, in the current environment, Chris, and we all know this really well. Um, there are very few operators out there that would then take, you know, sort of commercial embargoes on their own accord, um, providing, you know, safety red line, no problem, you know, security yeah, yeah, safety. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But, but even that's even that's still going to be a challenge in in an environment where you have an industry that's that's recovering. But 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 yeah yeah exactly. But I'm sorry to say, but however. If you only have diplomacy, you've mm. only got good intentions. True. Yeah. If you don't have, if you don't have a dog that can bite as well as bark, what's mm. the point of putting it on a chain? Because everybody just takes one meter beyond the length of the chain and they work around it. And and if we really need to, if we really need to do things properly now, Matthew, because you know there's so much pressure now on, on commercial issues mm. and, uh, and recovery and everybody wanting to do. But this is the time, surely, be to God, mm. that people are, are made to be aware of, you know, what can happen and why it's important to do things properly. So it's linked, it's got to be linked to national identity and national standards and national obligations, right? So and, and then and then trade between those countries or, and or then like trade having it, an exactly. secure pipeline. Yeah, exactly. I I recently um, moved to Europe and made a collection of um, purchases uh, for for the new place that I I moved into, and I was I was really intrigued by you know the raw materials that you know for the for the the dinner table for example the dining table were European right they were they were sourced from within Europe. And yet, the the retailer that I bought this from was a global brand. Yeah, it's literally in every country in the world. And so, uh, you know, and so the point I'm trying to make is, 
clearly, clearly there's a quality and there's a service level attached to how they source these raw materials. But that is within that is clearly taken place within a trusted, economic, secured supply chain of of Europe. Um, at which point, you know, me as the customer, I'm getting it at a price point I wouldn't I wouldn't achieve anywhere else in the world. Like the value that you you achieve from that sale is is quite remarkable. So when we take this back to the security and safety of a supply chain it does cost money to be able to perform that kind of foreign intervention that kind of foreign oversight at a at a point of departure to to ensure that your national interests are are, are taken care of um, we've got several examples you know over, over the course of time that have proven that if um, if if nations and ministries of transport are not able to to continue to drive and incentivize those international obligations, the very obligations that some of those countries have been a part of creating in the last twenty years, for for example, um, it it you know has detrimental impact to to not only na- national economies but regional and and so on. Yeah. So it it comes back to that point that I was. You know the title of our session is, you know, how do we pivot from this firewall security mentality to seeing security measures or perceiving security measures as truly a commercial asset in this case? But also change or be changed, and and um, you know things that I I I, I joke around like with some of my kids, friends, and stuff, you know, and and some of the guys that that I know they got all these Yankee Doodle Dandy fancy degrees that. You know, are, are as good as a chocolate, a, you know, a chocolate poker, or you know, what I'm saying, what, 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 what can that do anywhere in life? Whereas, you know, some of the things that should be going on, I, I think this is just my opinion. Schools, mm. TV, and press, where press always seems to go on the negative. Start being on the positive side and, mm. and educating people about the need for security and the need for sourcing, and possibly you, you mentioned there about an international brand, but sourcing European products for European markets. Well. They could probably do the same in some of their other global yep. markets, so that they reduce the amount of of you know of transfer and cost, etc. But I think you know if people are made aware of what you can do as an individual and what you should be aware of, so you don't make mistakes and you avoid certain things that don't ring true, you know. And it, mm. and if it's if it's just down to price, Matthew, then mm. you know there has to cut a risk. Normally, does come with it. Mm. And and I like like we're talking about we, we spoke about e commerce. And the thing that you know, I, I I was when if you want to go on and send something, very yeah. little questions are asked of you, mm, mm. and and very little, very little. You know, like you 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 fill out some of these forms and it comes up mm. red and it says if you don't fill in this box, you can't mm. make your booking or mm. you can't get the product away. Why are why are we not doing that as well and letting people be aware that if you knowingly or even if you ignorantly after this mm. advisory. Mm. Do something like that, boom, there's the penalty. And the penalty should go up proportionate, mm. uh, proportionately with the area of accountability mm. that you should have. And, and that should come into, into businesses as well with their with their basic license. Yeah, you you're absolutely right. It's the yin and yang of of trust and economic economic growth, right? The the higher the trust, yeah. the better opportunity for you to for you to grow. I was I was going to to segue into the the e-commerce prevalence right within the industry i've you know obviously without without naming operators i've experienced e-commerce as a you know retail customer and i've seen it you know rather intimately on the other side in how um you know commodities are, are arrived at how they're shipped how they're warehoused um secured how they're diversified from a road network to a to an uh, you know an air transport network. Um, how they then move within a domestic and international environment. So yep. it it kind of links back to my my opening gambit around the available data points in terms of the the properties of a commodity and how how shipments and um, commodities are, are arrived at. Um, e-commerce at, at least just from my sort of you know sample size that I've seen so far 
e-commerce is best placed to take advantage of that kind of screen to secured, um, you know, security as a commercial asset uh, opportunity in this case. So, uh, and specifically within within an international environment. So yeah. domestic standards, we all, we all we all get that, but. Um, being able to do cross-border type, type operations and do that in a secured, trusted way, yeah. Um, as we're seeing in some parts of the world, North America being being one of them, um, you're still going to have, you know, revenue and um, customs type targets. They, you know, those aspects still need to be moderated and advocated, you know, for and against, depending on the, those arguments. You know, I, th- I think those tariffs and the discussions around how those customs tariffs actually continue to provide supply chain security. You know, I think there needs to be more, more analysis, more discussion um, to take place on that. And and from what I've seen, at least within the European context, that that's quite healthy in the um, sort of public-private partnership piece that where they're trying to moderate these, um, you know, these these sort of customs taxes. But when you look at a, a jurisdiction like Canada, for example, they just introduced an, an e-tax, right, a digital tax, um, which, again, is, you know, the, impacting the supply chain and the value of the supply chain and, and of course, um, the ability of some of these you know, really high end controls that we talk about that are needed if, to to keep that trust. Yeah, but you're talking about trust. But if there was transparency of how those e taxes or any any of the mm. tariffs, mm. how the revenues were actually being used. Yep. yep. Now, if some products had a higher risk of security, so we say malpractice or whatever, then the tariff yep. should be a lot higher. But the revenue that's earned from it should go into the prevention or the or the controls. Yeah, it, exactly. I mean, this is an old. This is a real sort of, you know, cornerstone topic for for aviation. And um, if I just stay within the security tracks, is that, that's where it's most most comfortable. The passenger security fee is another one, another great example. In some jurisdictions, that's twenty five dollars a, a yeah. you know a direction, right? But but are you are you able to keep your jacket and shoes on? Of course not, right? You know. You pull out your laptops and your drinks and all all kinds of stuff. It's 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 madness, right? On top of on top of a data submission, in terms of your biometric information, in some parts of the world, that's that's over ten dollars. Yeah. So you're thirty five dollars down, <laughs> and you've 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 undressed for the for the experience, and you've given all your information away. <laughs> yep. Yep, no, I totally agree. It, and and it's it's something that people people need to be more aware of it. And and like I said, I I, I you know in schools, you know, mm. in some cases it looks I can I mean, all right, this is this is this is a an old dinosaur game, but I can remember our headmaster at, we were in an all boys Catholic school and he said that we were we were two lessons free a week. Mm. For that. So they made us start playing a bloody recorder. <laughs> Uh, what, what good is that? Do you know what I mean? Two <laughs> like 14 and 15 year olds starting to learn, you know, London's burning on a recorder. Yeah. It's an absolute waste of time. But if you had a couple of lessons a week mm. that covered things that you're going to be faced with in life mm. as far mm. as travel, security, you know, it would make mm. a lot more sense. I, I just. Yeah, I think uh, I, I heard a really good example of that recently. Um, they're teaching kids how to identify. Uh, or at least be aware of disinformation in terms of social media. Yes, right? yes, um, yes. Which, which I think is uh, absolutely pivotal. I mean, we got plenty of um, national security issues in the world at the moment, uh, where you can see perceptions are being exploited to a, to achieve a different kind of outcome, and they've been spoofed. Right? The, it's it's just not fact. It's just just not true, and. Um, how, but Matthew, if you look at it like from a reverse perspective, mm. how can they market it or present it to make it so appealing to people to be taken in by it? And mm. how can we not use those same those same sort of gimmicks or or, or frameworks mm. to make people realise what what is important? I think uh, you know we're 
really getting into some some heavy philosophies on this, but uh, you know, for me, I, and you know, I, I think you know, respectfully, we're part of almost part of the same generation. It's got to be a combination of a healthy virtual life and then yeah. a yeah. a true a true practical life that yes. that you know we both sort of grow up with the you know the prevalence of our normal life and then you have a virtual um aspect which we all know has been uh you know increased we're, we're doing this right now right I'd, I'd much rather be doing this in london over a coffee or or stronger right so yeah. um so yeah i think for for the you know it's done for our generation but for the next generations coming through it's 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 not only um you know learning about digital health and you know making sure that you do the right things online and and you know read and be be influenced by the right kind of information the other piece is um you know i, I don't want town planning to be reduced where they they don't put um emphasis on you know parks and free tennis courts and public swimming pools and yeah, yeah you know because yeah. because we're not using them right like I, I i certainly wouldn't want that kind of urban planning to to be reduced and within oh, yeah, 50 no, no, years no no, no i there's, totally, there's nothing totally, there yeah no i totally agree with you because if we let certain things go then god knows what it will turn into but listen yeah that's great and like you said we've got into a, a lot more detail <laughs> there and the next episode is covering human factors Mm. Um, in security and safety, which will be an interesting one. So um, good setup. Again, thank you very much. That's episode three out of the way.